Well, good morning, everybody. So good to be with you and uh, on this beautiful Lord's Day and with the Monta Vista Church. You guys are always so, so welcoming and uh, just so refreshing to give everybody a hug once again. So thank you for, for having me. Let's have our Bibles open to Joshua chapter 22. We're going to be studying from the book of Joshua today, chapter 22. We've got a lot to say, though, in, in way of introduction. And I want to introduce uh, this passage that's on the screen and just get to talking about one of these all things statements. So this is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. It says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I want to talk with you about one of those all things statements. I don't think this is advancing the slide. Okay. Are you advancing it or me? You? Okay. You and I are going to be closely communicating. <laughs> so hopes all things. Love hopes all things. Normally, beloved, when I have thought about this passage and applied it to my own personal life, I've always thought about how... I should be hoping for all things in my relationship with God. So normally when I, when I read this passage from 1 Corinthians 13, 7, I'm thinking about all the promises that God has given me that I, that I hope for. I hope for a resurrected body. I hope for the new heavens and the new earth. I hope to be in eternity with you all. I hope to be with my God and Savior. There's so many things to hope for because God has promised us those things. And if you trust God, if you love God, you're going to hope for all things. However, what I want to think about this morning is how does this apply to our human relationships? Because that word love is just the word agape. And I'm sure we've talked about that here at Monta Vista several, several times over the years. And that word agape love is used of human relationships, our interpersonal relationships too. So what does hoping all things look like in our, in our human relationships? I have to talk with you this morning. I, I want to open my heart about a weakness of mine. And I know preachers from time to time say when they're preaching or teaching, hey, I'm working on this too. This is a weakness of mine. And sometimes, admittedly so, preachers are just saying that to say that. Not to say that they're not working on it, but this is, this is a legitimate weakness of mine. Have you ever gotten like a text message or an email from somebody at work or somebody that you're friends with and you started doubting what they said or you started thinking about their intentions or their motives? I have an issue with thinking about or assigning people motives that I'm not super close with. Now, the closer that I am to somebody, like my wife, I, I know where she's coming from. If we're talking about something difficult, I know her so well. We love each other so well. I don't have a problem knowing what her motives and her intentions are. I'm talking about people that I'm acquaintances with, just you know, surface level friendships with. So I get a text message or I get an email at work and immediately where my head starts going, especially if they're stepping on my toes a little bit, immediately where my head starts going is, why is this person saying that? Don't they appreciate me? Don't they appreciate my perspective? Don't they appreciate the challenges that we're going through? Why are they saying this? And I start assigning motives. In fact, it gets so bad in my deep, dark mind, and it is a dark place sometimes. It gets so bad, I will start having conversations with people in my own head. And last time I checked, you needed two people to have a conversation. So when I'm having these conversations with this person in my head, I'm, I'm assigning them words. They're saying things to me in my own head, but I'm assigning those words myself. And so I'm assigning motive, I'm assigning intentions, and all of it is complete and total fiction. And oftentimes my, my emotions will start getting geared up. I'll start feeling frustrated, I'll start feeling depressed, I'll start feeling angry or whatever, based on this imaginary conversation that I'm having with this person 
because I'm assigning them motives. I'm thinking about their intentions, their tone, their attitude. The closest thing that I can come up with as a parallel to this, those of you who remember dreams, have you ever woken up from a dream and you, you, were, you were sweating, you felt anxious, you felt frustrated, you felt scared maybe, uh, you felt excited if it was a good dream. Now, I don't remember very many dreams. I think people who remember dreams are completely weird. Okay, I, the only time that I remember dreams is like when I'm taking Mucinex. I don't know what's in Mucinex. Austin, you could probably tell me, but it should say like dream making potion on it. So like twice a year when I get a cold and I take Mucinex, those are the instances that I remember dreams. But my wife tells me she remembers like all of her dreams and I think she's making it all up. But twice a year or so, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up from a dream and I'll have my emotions tied to this dream and it's complete and total fiction. It didn't happen. Whether I was excited or whether, whether it was a bad dream or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's fiction and these, these conversations that I have in my mind with people assigning their motives, thinking about their intentions, thinking about their attitude in these imaginary conversations, it's complete and total fiction. Well, if you've ever had an issue with that, I've got a story for you here in Joshua chapter 22. Advance the slide for me. Before we begin reading, on the screen here um, is, is a little bit of a map of how they divvied up the land when they made the conquest. So Joshua 22 has a lot of war in it because they were invading the land of Canaan and they were going to be kicking out all the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the you, Perizzites and all of those people groups. And this is how they divvied it up by clan. Well, you can see on the right side of the screen, there was two and a half tribes that wanted to stay east of the Jordan. So other than the Mediterranean Sea on the left side of the map, the three bodies of water that you can see kind of down the middle, you see the Dead Sea there down the bottom right, and that's dead because it's full of salt, nothing lives in there. And then up near the top, nor the, the northern part of Israel, you see the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus hung out a lot. That's where a lot of the apostles fished for a living. And then in between there, you can't see that it's blue, but in between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is the, the Jordan River. And that Jordan River is where John the Baptizer baptized. It's where Jesus himself was baptized. A lot of cool events happened at these three bodies of water. But you'll see that it's a natural barrier, and that's going to come up later in the text. There's a reason why we're going over the geography here. So on the east side, you have Gad and you have Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And these three tribes had made a deal with Moses before they went into the land to conquest it and you know, conquer the, the people groups. They asked Moses, they said, we've got a lot of people in our clans and we've got a lot of livestock and we'd like to stay over here on the east. And Moses said, that's fine, deal. But you've got to come over with us. You've got to conquer the land first. And then once everything is conquered and we divvy up the land, then you guys can go back. And that's where we are here in Joshua 22. Everybody's been conquered for the most part. Okay? We understand there was a few people groups left and they were going to become thorns. But for, for the most part, there's, there's peace now in the land around them. And, the, and Joshua approaches the two and a half tribes and says, you guys held up your end of the bargain you can go home. Begin reading with me in Joshua 22, verse 1 through 6. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. Great job, guys. Now it's time for you to go home. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. That's going to come up a couple of times. Only, this is verse 5, 
Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them, sent them away, and they went to their tents. So jo Joshua approaches them again and says, great job. Thank you for upholding your end of the bargain. You can go home now. But he warns them. It's kind of like kids going off to college, you know. I imagine you would have this conversation with somebody that was leaving your home. Only be careful. Be careful to do what God says. Because they had had a couple of instances in their past where they didn't do what God says, and God got angry with them. We're going to talk about a couple of those instances too. So they go back on the other side of the Jordan, and, and they, were, they were right here in Ephraim. See where it says Shiloh there in, in Ephraim? That's where most of them were encamped. So they're going to travel across the Jordan, and probably right in there, right on the west side of the Jordan, and that's significant. On the west side of the Jordan, these two and a half tribes are going to build an altar of imposing size. We're not told the dimensions, but the scripture does say it was an imposing sized altar. You can see that in verse 10, Joshua 22, verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. Now, if you're reading this for the very first time, you're probably thinking, not a big deal. Lots of Israelites built altars throughout the Old Testament. What's, there's no big deal with this, except what the Western tribes thought was, it's time to go to war based on what they just built. Now, hold, hold on just a second. War? They just conquered the land of Canaan. They just finished. That's why the two and a half tribes are going to the east side of the Jordan, because they're done with the conquest. You know what the western tribes are thinking? It's time to go to war with those two and a half tribes. If you're thinking to yourself, what's the big deal here? Look at verse 12. And when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Incredible! Based on an altar that was built on the west side, you'll see what's going on in their, in their mind in just a moment. So they're gathered at Shiloh now for war against these eastern two and a half tribes. But they decide to send a delegation. So they have ten heads of the families along with Phineas, the priest, and they're going to go talk to the two and a half tribes. But instead of asking genuinely, asking sincerely, hey, hey guys, you built an altar on the west side of the Jordan. What's going on there? Instead of asking, what you get is complete and total accusations. Finger pointing. What is this breach of faith? What is this rebellion? And you can see that in 16, 17, and 18. Look at your Bibles, please. Joshua 22, verse 16. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? You know, my translation has a question mark there. Your English translation probably has a question mark. You can totally disregard that. This is not a question like we would ask, like, what is this? breach of faith. No, this is more accusation. What is this? What are you doing? Verse 17. Have we not had enough? They're going to give a, a little history lesson here. Have we not had enough at the sin of Peor, from which we have not even cleansed ourselves fully, and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord? Verse 18. That you too must turn away this day from following the Lord. And if you too rebel against the Lord today, then tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Oh, okay, now we're seeing what's going through the mind. The reason why they mustered for war at Shiloh, based on that altar, was they thought that was idolatry. They thought that was rebellion. A breach of faith. And so they give a little history lesson. Don't you guys remember what happened at Peor? You remember that instance where they became sexually immoral and, and God broke out against them with a plague and God was extremely upset? And, and then they give a second history lesson. Look at uh, 
Verse 20, Joshua 22, verse 20. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things? And wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel, and he did not perish alone for his iniquity. God didn't just perish, you know, Achan and his family. No, what happened at Jericho was Achan took some stuff from Jericho that they were supposed to devote to total destruction. And the next battle, they got whooped at Ai. Lots of Israelites paid for Achan's sin. And their point is, yes, it was you that built this altar, but we're going to pay as a family. We're going to get punished as a family. Now, it, again, if this was the first time you'd ever read this, this passage... You know what you might be tempted to think? All right, the West is really taking faith seriously. West, 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 West. Only it was complete and total fiction. Sound like a guy? You know? Except they had assigned motives and intentions that were completely false. So you might be asking, well, then what was the purpose? Well, let's let the two and a half tribes talk now, now that they've done all the finger pointing. Verse 21. Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh said in answers to, to the heads of the families of Israel, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows. And let Israel itself know, if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for, for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings. In other words, kind of like what they did at Dan and Bethel later on in the story with Jeroboam. If we did this to replace the tabernacle, what do they say? May the Lord himself take vengeance. We deserve to die. If what you're saying is true, if this is a breach of faith, if this is rebellion, if this is idolatry, we deserve to die. Now, you might be asking if you forget the story or this is the first time you've read it, so, so what's the deal? <laughs> you have these West groups mustered for war at Shiloh, you have these East groups saying, hey, listen, we didn't build this altar to replace tabernacle worship or to serve another God. We didn't do it because of that. And here's the answer. It, it literally will break your heart. We did this for you. We did this for you guys. Because they bring up the geography, and this is why I wanted to go over the geography. They say, we, we've got this natural border here of the Jordan River. And we were scared. They, they literally used the word fear in the text. We feared that your offspring, your generations to come, your descendants to come, we feared that they would forget about us. We feared that they would say, you know what? They're on the other side and they're not part of us. They have no portion in the Lord. We were scared. So we built this altar literally as a witness, and it gets to be called the altar of witness. We built it so that you and future generations wouldn't forget about us. Can you imagine the crickets? <laughs> and, and then the answer from the West was, uh, oh, so we're good then. Literally, they said, it was right in their eyes. Their response was right in their eyes. So they go back to Shiloh, where they're mustered for war there. And you can imagine people like sharpening their swords. Like, shh, shh, shh. And these 11 delegates show up. <laughs> Guys, put down your weapons. This is, we, we got the talking. We're not going to go to war with these two and a half tribes. And they explain the situation. And, and the text says, not only was the answer right in their eyes, they go one step further. When Shiloh heard about it, you know what they said? You know what they did? They praised God. We are one family. They're not idolatrous. This was not a breach of faith. 
and they avoided civil war by the skin of their teeth because they communicated. Now, let's get to some application. We started with 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Be hopeful. Love hopes all things. Beloved, be hopeful with the ones you love and think the best of them. This is what I believe hopes all things means in our human relationships. That was the question for this sermon. How does that show up in our interpersonal relationships? We need to be hopeful with the ones we love and think the best of them. You know, I almost changed this slide because when I write on the slide, be hopeful with the ones you love, what's, who's the first people that you think of when you say, you know, of the ones that I love, that you love, who do you think of? Your family, your friends, the, your closest comrades in the church, that's who you think of. But that word agape is used of everybody, right down to our enemies. So we're not talking about loving people who love us. Jesus said, that's not very special. In the Sermon on the Mount, you remember when he said, even sinners love those who love them. There are atheists' marriages that are great. There are agnostic families that have great marriages and great families. Loving people who love you isn't very special. We've got to do this right down to our enemies. And always, always, always communicate before accusation thoughts. Now, did you notice I put down thoughts, not just words? So you might have accusation thoughts and then communicate, but then you, you know, there's still this little bit of tension because you believe that their motives are this, you believe their intentions are this. No, don't let yourself do the Allen thing and have conversations and assign motives. Communicate even before then. Now, can you imagine these two approaches? I, I'm so glad that Joshua 22 ends well, but the ends don't justify the means, do they? Just because the story ends well doesn't justify the means. So I want you to think about these two approaches. The Western tribes go over to the East and they say, and they ask sincere, genuine questions. Hey, we saw that you built an altar on the West side of the Jordan. There's a lot of rumors going around. Why did you build that? Now, what kind of response do you think that's going to... I would say barriers would come down, wouldn't you think? Versus the finger pointing, what is this breach of faith? What is this rebellion? Don't you know the scripture? You know, let me give you the history lesson of Peor and Achan. And barriers come up. So you might have a brother or sister at Monte Vista who's struggling in your faith, and you could approach it in two different ways. What is this breach of faith? I can't believe you do this. You know better. Don't you know the scripture? And that might be an exaggeration. I, I, I get it, but you, it makes the point, doesn't it? Or you could approach the brother and sister and you say, you know, it seems like there might be a, a spiritual issue. I don't know. I don't know what you're dealing with. And then you ask sincere questions. Is there anything I need to know about? Better yet, is there anything I could help you with? Now, which, which of those approaches brings up barriers and which of those approaches brings down barriers? Now, I want to tell you about a, something that happened to me and how this story slapped me in the face. So I told you earlier, and I couldn't be more serious, I have a legitimate problem with assigning motives to people that I don't know very well. So I got an email several months ago, but I got an email from somebody at our corporate office, which happens to be in Florida. And let's just say I didn't appreciate it very well. So I started doing my thing. I can't believe they don't appreciate my perspective. I don't think they understand my challenges. I don't think they understand this. Why didn't they get me involved earlier? Why didn't they ask something earlier? I started accusing in my mind. And then I asked somebody recently, 
or during, during that time, I was getting, I wasn't just gossiping, you know, I wasn't gossiping at all. I was getting their opinion about what I should do. So I was relaying the email and I was relaying my challenges and all that. And then the guy said, my comrade said, listen to this. Have you talked with them? I, uh, <sighs> no, I, I didn't. And like 48 hours later, and I'm not joking, 48 hours later, I was reading Joshua to my girls, and we came upon Joshua 22. I don't think my girls understood a word of the story, but I sure did. And I thought to myself right there, laying down in my girls' room, I said, this is the word of God talking to my heart. I reached out to that gentleman at the Florida corporate office. We had a great conversation. He ended up apologizing because he didn't understand some things. And I ended up apologizing to him. I, there were some things that I didn't realize. Now, I'm coming in the back door on you. Because guess what this sermon is about? Marriage. Ooh, I, I love sneaking in the back door. It's about marriage. Where we could apply this the most, these two things that are on the screen, where you could apply that the most is in your marriages. <laughs> Beloved, I know that 99% of you already know, <laughs> but I hope that in saying this, it helps our marriages just a little bit in, in the next little while. But you are going to experience, husbands and wives, you are going to experience a time where you do not feel heard, you do not feel seen, you do not feel appreciated, they don't understand what's going on at work, they don't understand the stress that I'm walking in the door with, they don't understand what I'm going through with the dishes or the laundry or whatever. And, and if you're single and you're thinking, dishes and laundry, this is crazy, listen, you shouldn't get married right now if that's what you think. Okay. It may sound like a small thing, but when it's you, when it's you feeling it, it's not, it's not a small thing, is it? And what this entire lesson is essentially about is putting yourself in the shoes of another person, trying to think how they think. So here's what you need to do. Once you feel unseen, unheard, underappreciated, here's what you need to do. It's really profound advice. You're going to need to talk about it. You're going to need to communicate. And how are you going to approach that communication? Finger pointing? You never appreciate what, what I'm dealing with? You don't see what I, I... I don't ever get the support. I don't ever get the help. So you can appreciate it. You can approach it like that. What is this breach of faith? What is this rebellion? Don't you know? Or you could say, hey... I'm feeling underappreciated, I'm feeling unseen, I'm feeling unhelped, can we talk about it please? And then you might, you might realize the other person has a different perspective that you didn't know about. But it has helped me greatly, it has helped Vera greatly. And, and you know what I have gotten from these conversations that aren't always comfortable? Every single time we have them, it's good for us. So let's be hopeful with the ones we love. Let's think the best of them. And then always, always, always communicate before accusing thoughts even. Let's put away our Bibles and get ready to sing the song of invitation. Thank you so much for your good listening. You know, the first sermon at Monta Vista, I always liked the best. And for, for a few different reasons, but the reason why I liked it the best the most, and it didn't happen very often, but I always thought it would be really cool for someone to obey the gospel and then like an hour later be able to take the Lord's Supper with our family. It's just a cool thought. And normally, like 99% of the time in the churches of Christ, the sermon's always after the Lord's Supper. So it's just kind of cool that an invitation gets to be, be had before the Lord's Supper. 
So if today's the day, I don't know who you are, but if you're out there and you're ready to turn away from sin or have turned away from sin and you're ready to confess the great name of Jesus, we want to be a part of your baptism. Will you come? As together we stand and sing. Live for Jesus, oh my brother.